welcome to The Green Initiative, a podcast where we discuss, educate and challenge our listeners on how to implement green energy and discuss efficient ways to build back better. My name is Daniela Jervis and I'll be your host for the series. To give you a bit of background, I'm from National Housing Group. NHG acquires and develops sustainable property in order to provide permanent housing solutions to help tackle the homelessness crisis within the UK. Welcome to The Green Initiative, a podcast where we discuss, educate and challenge our listeners on how to implement green energy and discuss efficient ways to build back better. Today, I'm very excited to welcome our first guest, uh, Paul Hutchins. He is a renewable energy specialist and CEO at Eco to Solar. Um, This episode, Paul and I will discuss solar panels, uh, (laughs) what they are, the benefits and challenges, how they work with environmental, social and corporate governance. Paul, do you want to give us a bit of an introduction and background to yourself? Thanks, Danny. Well, I'm, I'm really excited to be here and actually I'm quite honoured and um, I'm really pleased that I'm, I'm your first guest. So uh, so um, if you're a bit nervous, I am too, because um, I, I've not done one of these for, for a long time. So so uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, my name is Paul Hutchins. Um, I, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Eco2 Solar Limited. Um, I founded a company back in 2007, back in the times when solar and sustainability and those kind of things were probably not quite as well known as they are today. In fact, everybody thought I was a little bit mad. Um, and uh, generally speaking, people couldn't see the vision really of having having solar panels powering lots of things and being seen on lots of buildings in and in many fields across the whole of the world. Never mind just in the UK. So, so um, I guess I was a kind of an accidental visionary in that sense that you know I kind of, I kind of thought I spotted something other people hadn't hadn't and an opportunity in the market. Uh, plus, it was an op- you know an opportunity really to to do something good in the world to actually make a difference, and that's one of my fundamental values really is how do I make a difference in the world um so so whatever business idea I had um had to be something that you know made me feel as if I was I was um uh, making a contribution to society to future generations and something that my mum and dad might be proud of really um so uh, having started the business in 2007 the business has grown not not in a straight line or a linear fashion I have to say they call it the solar coaster for good reason um and the, the business has grown over the last sort of 14 15 years to be uh, arguably the the leading uh, residential solar company in the UK. Great. Um, well, I'm very pleased to have you on today. So I guess we should start at the beginning. Uh, what are solar panels? Well, so solar panels, um, in really simple terms, are, are, are a medium that allows, uh, allows it to uh, collect energy from the sun in the form of, of solar energy or radiation and convert it into electrical energy. There's actually several types of solar panels. The two main ones really are ones that create electricity um, and others that create heat, which are a little bit more straightforward in some ways. But the ones that we mostly install are called solar photovoltaic um, after the photovoltaic effect that was discovered by somebody in 1950 or something, uh, also known as PV panels. But it's, it's a method of actually taking um, two, two, two layers of silicon um, and the difference, one's positive, one's negative, and it allows you to generate energy from it. You then put a thing called an inverter in, which you might see on a train set, or sometimes you get them on computers, which takes um, DC energy and converts it into AC energy you can use either in the grid or in your home or your building. Great. And there are different types of materials that you can use, not just silicone, isn't there? Yeah, there's a number of different materials. The majority of them, to be fair, are silicone. Um, there's a number of other materials that can be used, most of which are still really sitting in the lab, I guess. And there's, there's graphene and, and perisphite and those kind of things that can be used to, to create the photovoltaic effect. Um, but generally speaking, probably 99.9% of panels out there are actually silicon panels. And Germany are leading the forefront in Europe, um, aren't they? So where are the UK going wrong? And I guess what should we be doing better in order to start putting these on our homes? Uh, that, that probably goes, goes back to you know the, the way that the UK government and UK culture, I suppose, diff- differs to, let's say, Japanese uh, or, or German culture, where, we, where they tend to think a little bit longer term. Um, certainly, if you look, you know the way they invest in lots of things, not just solar panels, is a bit, bit longer term. Whereas the, 
um, the government in this country always has been, and particularly at the moment, tends to be, what's, what's the next thing that's going to get me some votes? Um, so there tends to be a bit of a chopping and changing of policy, whereas in, in Germany they're a little bit more consistent, I think a bit longer term. Um, that said, they've had their issues as well, um, and um, they, they get on quite, got in quite early with incentives, um, and what they call the feed-in tariff, which we had in this country for a while as well, which encouraged quite quite a large-scale development. And because they were in quite early, they were able to generate their own their own uh, manufacturing industry, if you like, for things like inverters and some solar panels and lots of electronics and meters and things um, that we've been playing catch-up with since. That said, we're probably about number five or number six in the world for solar power, so we're not doing that bad. No. And we've got the Part L of the Building Regulations UK coming in in summer 2022. Um, do you want to explain that? Yeah, the, the Building Regulations is quite interesting because uh, that, that, that's really what drives um, what happens in new build houses. And, and you know, housing developers will, will do what they need to do to meet the building regulations and not necessarily much more uh, and what their customers demand or what their customers need. So sustainability really had quite a strong agenda in the UK up until about 2015 when David Cameron and George Osborne seemed to think that we didn't need it anymore and kind of ditched it all. Um, so we've been working on, on, on building regulations from 2013 for, for quite a long period of time now. Uh, the new building regulations uh, and sustainability has come back like a train, as somebody once said recently. Um, and, and actually sustainability is really, really strong now on the political and government agenda. And that's not just true in the UK, it's also true in Europe and, and always has been, but also true now with Biden in the US and other places as well. So I think there's this real political clout for uh, political um, uh, leverage, I suppose, for uh, for sustainability. So the new part L of the building regulations that come into force in 2022 um, are a big uplift, 31% uplift in, in terms of um, sustainability. So 30% less carbon, if you like, than the old building regulations from 2013. And the, new, the ones that come in in 2025, that they're calling the future home standard, where they're going to ban uh, fossil fuels from, from homes altogether, from new homes altogether, uh, that will be a 75 to 80% improvement in building regulations over 2013. So, so we see, from, from a, looking purely at solar, we see that um, from having, just in England alone, Wales and Scotland are different, just in England alone, probably about 10% of homes get, new homes get, uh, get solar. That'll go up to about 70 or 80% uh, by about 2024, so big change. Wow. So how will that impact those who don't, uh, they're not new builds, they already have their houses? That, well, it won't affect those directly initially. Um, but what the expectation is, is that, that, that if new build tends to be seen as a sort of pinnacle, if you like, of, of um, it's, it's aspirational of what a house could look like. New houses tend to have a bit of a premium on them of about 10, 20 percent. And people quite like new homes. I suppose it's like a new car as opposed to a second hand one, I guess. Um, so, so, so as a result of that, you know, you tend to find a new home has got the latest technology in it. So it will have a knock-on effect in terms of people will look at their aspiration and say, I'd like my home to be like that, that you know, brand new Barrett or Red Row home. But also they're using the future home standard um, over the next five years or so as, as, the, as, the, as the lead in really to what they're going to do for other buildings. So they're currently consulting as government having done it for new build homes they're now consulting for non-domestic new build buildings um, but also for uh, for buildings generally so so what will they do to incentivize or actually force um, homeowners to to be more sustainable with their homes going forward and they could use incentives like grant type schemes for example or they could do the other around they could you know if they could tie people's cancelled tax bills to their epc level for example or they could um, insist that if you do something to your house like I don't know, put an extension on or something, you need to make it more sustainable. So I think there'll be a, it'll probably be a measure of maybe carrot and stick, which yeah. comes out of this as they start to push towards this net zero in 2050, which is the overall, you know, overarching target. Great. And you mentioned the grant scheme. So what is what are available to people right now? Right now, there's there's a scheme called the Smart Export Guarantee Scheme. Um, what that means is if you, somebody will fit a meter for you, one of you, your utility company probably, uh, and they will measure what you don't use and gets exported to the grid and presumably used by somebody else. Um, and you will be paid an amount per unit of electricity you, you export. Now that amount varies depending on the on the utility provider you've got. So they basically make an offer of a different amount. So unlike the feeding tariff, which was in place between 2010 and 2019, where there was a fixed amount nationally, 
Um, this will depend on on what your um, your, your provider will, will offer. So I guess that you know when you if you've got solar panels um, and you want to export some of your energy, I guess as well, as well as looking at the cost of electricity that you're buying, you'd also be looking at the price of electricity you get for it when you sell it to them. Great. So let's talk about price. How much is a solar panel going to cost? What type of one can I have on my house? All those sorts of benefits and challenges that we are going to need to discover about in order to put them on. Yes, of course. The, the good thing about solar is it's, it, it is suitable for a large number of buildings. So, so long, long as you've got a, a roof that's either flat or, or facing roughly south, which could be anywhere between east and west, really. So probably, I guess, po- possibly 40, 50, 60 percent of, of homes in the UK are suitable for, for a solar system. And you have to have um, a certain amount of degree on your roof don't you you can't have it very yeah, inverted you, or whatever you, you, well you, you can have it flat but then you need to elevate it slightly and uh, but you, you it's, it's talking about how efficient it is so so the, the most efficient is about 30 or 40 degrees which is probably the average pitch of a roof and um, but if you if you put it at 50 degrees or 20 degrees for example you might lose a few percent of your efficiency but not necessarily that much so the most important thing actually for solar panels is they're not shaded so if you've got a, a great big tree that you, you know in front of the solar panels, um, you know facing south, um, uh, or above, you know tall tall building, that's the more likely to scupper it than the exact angle or or inclination of the of the solar panels. So so assuming your you know, your average building can have solar on it, the, the average size system will probably be about three kilowatts. I guess you could get onto a home, um, and the cost of that would probably be about three or four grand. Um, which, which obviously is a chunk of money, but that's probably ten percent of what they would have cost twelve years ago. Because it's gone down, because every, it's quite popular now, I guess. Yeah, economies of scale really kicked in. I mean, obviously, most most panels are, are made in the far east now. Um, at least, at least the the silicon is anyway, which is a, a subject in itself. Um, but the economies of scale are huge, you know. So, so the the price reductions have been massive. So say I have bought my property and I, it's my temporary, well not temporary my home, but it's the one before I get for my permanent home. Am I going to break even? Is it going to really work out for me in the long term? Uh, well, I, I would say yes, wouldn't I? Of course. Um, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm preaching the converter, I guess. Um, the, 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 the payback on, on, on them is pretty good, actually. Um, I mean, obviously, you've got a, an immediate payback from an environmental perspective in the sense that you're, you're doing your bit for the planet. Um, you're also reducing your energy bills as well. Um, so, so if you, How much uh, roughly and, and, and can they uh, reduce by? Well, it depends on the size of the system. So, so you know, if you if you if you if, if you're putting a system in, of say about four kilowatts, for example, um, three or four kilowatts, it might produce around about three thousand units of electricity a year. To, to, it, it gets quite complicated because it depends. And some of you would need to survey the house and look at your energy uses because it depends on you know how, how much of that energy will you use directly. Um, how, how much will you end up uh, sending back to the grid? Because there's an equation. Maybe you don't get quite as much for selling it to the grid through the smart export scheme as you do as it costs you to actually buy them. So, so, but, but on average, if you're looking at a solar system on on a, on a decent house, you'd be getting your money back between eight and twelve years. Um, and the, and the, the systems will last for 30 or 40 years. And also, if you look at that as a return on investment of somewhere between sort of you know eight and 12 percent, it's a lot better than you get in the bank. Yeah. And also, is, can't you store some of the energy that you that you that it does provide? You certainly can. If you put uh, an energy storage system, uh, normally a battery, um, into uh, into your home, and that, that can be done also, you know, on, on a larger level. So you could have it for the street, for example, or or, or a housing estate. But if you let's assume you've got a, a system in in your a battery in your house that allows you to to store all of the energy that's been generated by the solar panel. So now you're not exporting any of it potentially. Um, so obviously that's going to make the payback a lot faster. It's certainly going to make the, um, the, the the amount of energy you get to use much better. And you're getting closer to being self-sufficient really with energy. So also we had the, uh, the London solar panel map. I don't know if you've had a look. Um, but so do you want to talk us to us about how that helps Londoners find out if their property is in the right area and the conditions and things like that? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant thing. And maybe you could post the link somewhere, um, you know, on, on this podcast so people can go and have a look. Definitely. But um, the whole of London has been mapped right down to property level. So you can actually look at, at your property or, or a building in, in London and it will tell you um, to what extent your building is suitable for solar down to exactly how much energy you're going to get per annum from it. So I guess that's a, that's an estimate going forward because of, obviously the weather varies year on year um but but you know it, it, it's a really accurate assessment um of and a really granular assessment so it actually goes down to individual rooms as to whether whether they're suitable and even how suitable they are so you could sort of say well that one's very suitable because i get so much energy that one might be 10 percent more or 10 percent less um, but it allows you to make a comparison as well so i mean that that i mean i, I have no idea what it costs them to uh, to do that piece of work but imagine you could do that for the whole of the country that'd be fantastic be brilliant and then also, I wondered if it would make any difference when they have this map available, if our planning regulations and things like that, does it mean that it would be easier to get planning or do we still need to go for planning? Generally speaking, solar panels don't need planning. Okay. Um, they, they come under pretty development. So there are certain exceptions to that, like listed buildings, for example, where you do um, and conservation areas and that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, they don't need planning. Great. So let's talk about the challenges then. So I know everyone's probably thinking the same thing what about the weather in the UK. Um, obviously when it's cloudy, although the, stun the sun isn't directly on us, it's still shining and it's still available and giving us energy. But do you want to talk a bit mm. more about like the rain and all that sort of stuff? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the, I mean, the, the, there are um, relatives to this. So, so um, you know, do, do solar panels work really well in the UK? Yes, they do. You know, do they work better in sub sub-Saharan Africa? Yeah, probably they do. Um, and in terms of the amount of energy they generate, but if, the way that we we look at it is is that actually the, the the amount of energy they generate is calculated based on the area you're installing it. So whether if you're installing it in Spain, for example, or you're installing it in Scotland, um, we, we can we we can estimate quite accurately across the year how much energy you're going to generate. Now, obviously, we don't. There's different between climate, if you like, and, and, and the irradiation levels across the whole year compared to what's going to happen on, on, on a day-by-day -day basis. So we can't tell you whether your solar panels are going to generate loads of energy on the, on the 14th of August, for example, or they might generate a lot less because it's really cloudy and pouring with rain. But what we can say with, with some certainty is that over a period of the year, and certainly over a period of 10 years, how much they're going to generate. And we, we know we, we can get that down to quite a, quite a granular level. So we know that, you know, over Cornwall, for example, it might be slightly better than um, Somerset, and Somerset might be slightly better than Birmingham. Um, but it, it is quite slight. You know, as you start to move north, the amount of difference is, is, is actually less than you'd think. Um, and the other thing, of course, is, is that solar panels work at their best when it's cold. Um, yeah, this might sound counterintuitive, um, but so, so so obviously the more the more irradiation there is, which basically is is you know is, is the is the uh, the energy that comes from the sun. The more of that there is, the more energy it produces. But the hotter it is, um, that it actually uh, reduces the efficiency. So actually, if you, if you can have a really really clear day in spring, um, solar panels work better. Than, than than a um, I don't know a mildly cloudy day in in summer for example or even a fully uh, fully uh, cloudless day in summer because the heat is less. So 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 if you, if you did if you're in, I don't know if you're in the very far north if you, if you do happen to get a very sunny day they're more effective again because it's cooler. Okay. So there is a bit of an equation there. So 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 if you're if you're having solar panels in the desert, for example, of, of you know, the Sahara Desert, for example, um, you need to look at some way of cooling them probably because they're going to start to lose efficiency because of the amount of heat it creates. So then when they're looking at, obviously, say, taking them from the Sahara and things like that, does that matter with the material that's using and things like that? So instead of silicone, is there not a better material for better weather and things like that? Or is the silicone the best weather for the UK? Yeah, well, silicon is silicon is the best material overall at the moment because because it's ubiquitous, because it's available, and because it's it's reasonably priced. There's lots of other things out there, but they're very expensive. So if if you were going to look at um, putting I don't know, banks of solar panels anywhere, really, it's in Spain, a, a farm in Wiltshire or, or sub-Saharan Africa. You know, you need a lot of them to actually make any difference and make it worthwhile transporting to somewhere else. So when you've got lots and lots of solar panels, obviously one of the big factors is how much they cost. So if you could get something that's you know twenty percent more effective but costs five times as much, it, 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 you know, it doesn't work. So so in terms of economies of scale, 
for the moment anyway you know uh, silicon's where it's at how can we integrate the a lot of people think that solar panels are ugly how can we integrate them into the roof a bit more so they just look a bit more pleasant okay um i, I think we've all driven around um around uh, streets and uh, housing estates and so on, seeing, seeing some really quite ugly looking solar installations, bright blue panels sticking up about the roof. Maybe some of them, are, you know, some of them in landscapes, some of them in portrait, and they just really don't look very good. And I think we've got a lot better at uh, at, in, at installing those now. Um, and, and certainly from our perspective, the majority that we would install will be uh, integrated into the roof. Um, so they'll be all black, integrated into the roof. So if you can see them at all, which you maybe you can't from a distance, um, if you can see them at all, they look like big Velux windows. So they're kind of neat. There's no, no white or blue or anything. They're all black and they sit as flush with the roof. So they look much, much better. Um, you can also get solar tiles as well. They are more expensive and are probably a little bit less efficient actually as well. But you can get solar tiles. And particularly if you cover the whole roof in solar tiles, they, they do look pretty good. Do you need a flat roof for solar tiles or can you... No, just a normal roof. They just sit like a normal tile on a roof, and you can replace, you know, slates or tiles with these with those solar tiles. And you said um, that it just it basically more... becomes the roof. You said sorry to interrupt you. You said that they're not as efficient. Why is that? Because of the the technology that they use, um, that they are because of the, the way that they're um, that they're constructed. Um, they are, it's only about ten percent or something, but they're slightly less um, less effective. You, you get parts of them uh, that cover each other, for example, because of the way you have to fit them, uh, um, and, and you lose a bit of them. It's so not, um, and they're quite expensive normal. too. Okay, um, then let's talk about how we can incorporate all the solar energy into our household. Okay, um, so, so the thing about solar is it produces electricity, or solar PV produces electricity, which is which is a really useful form of energy because we can use it for most things. Whereas with heat, for example, um, you know you, you've got some hot water or something, you have to either use it or store it somewhere um, uh, for use later, which is more difficult. As electricity is used in, in kind of everything in the home, really, isn't it? From from you know from your washing machine to heating water to heating boiling kettles, you know, running in Nintendo games or your, <laughs> um, or your laptop. Um, you can also use it for things like, um, like charging your car, for example, if you've got an electric car, um, you can store it in a battery. Um, you, but you can also start to get hold of uh, what we call demand side response things, things like smart plugs, for example, where they, they, if you have excess electricity, those can be triggered to come on and switch on your, you know, your, your, your washing machine or your tumble dryer or something. Um, in order to use the excess electricity you've got, so so and, and you can also control this, you know, through 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 smart home um, mechanisms where you can have something either that sets itself automatically, like a Nest, for example. Is that Google like a Nest. smart meter? I was about to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like a smart meter or, or, or even a smart um, a smart device, which will say, okay, we've got energy. What we're going to do with it, and it can learn your habits about, you know, when when do you have a shower, so it knows when to eat your water and that kind of thing. But it also knows when to when when there's going to be when there is or will be using the weather forecast when there will be excess solar energy, and then, therefore you know switch things on and off. Um, and you can control these things on a smartphone as well, of course, which is really great these days. And Nest isn't the only provider that does things like that. Do you know any others so that people can research a couple? Yeah, yeah. So that others are available. You put me on the spot now. There's, there's, um, there's, 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 there's Nest, isn't there? I think there's one called Hive. I think so. Um, it's available. Um, and there's quite a, quite a few other um, devices out there you could find if you just you know, sort of Google I think Nest smart, and Hive smart are the energy most popular devices. Ones. Yeah, the two the two main ones. Yeah. Okay, so would you say that solar panels on your house are worth it? Of course I would. Mm. <laughs> um, they are something that, that is probably the easiest technology to install on your house or, or building of any type. Um, it's one of the most cost effective, certainly, to do that. But also they're really, really fit and forget. So if you put a solar panels on your house... And they will last for 30, 40 years, and you should get no problems with them. Whereas other forms of technologies like you know, like wind turbines and heat pumps and other things are great technologies, but there's lots of moving parts, and they, and they, they can be a bit more troublesome. Um, so solar PV is, is really cost-effective. It's easy to install. There's loads of people out there that do install it, um, and it, and it lasts for a long time with very little problems. Um, and in terms of the the, the amount of um, benefit you get financially, it's also worth doing as well as well as obviously the environmental benefits. 
Of course. And then obviously looking at climate crisis and things like that, how do you think solar panels will influence buyers' decisions on homes that already have them on or when you're thinking about putting them on your home, how it will influence that? I think that's going to grow massively. I mean, when I when I first started doing this, there were there were less than ten thousand buildings in the UK with with solar PV on them. Now there's more like you know one point two, one point three million of them. So you know it's still it's still a minority of homes, but now you know it's, it's a decent chunk. And I think that it's now becoming more. Um, it comes into people's consciousness, doesn't it? That you know, that having solar panels on your house is 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 not a weird thing to do. It's something you can do. Something that makes a difference. And I think everybody now knows somebody who's got solar panels on their house. I also think that there's um, you know, there's maybe a a, a, um, a generational thing here as well as as that. I think that it tends to be the case that younger people care more about the environment, maybe than than and more more aware, should we say, of these things than some of the. Uh, you know, sort of middle and older generations. And I think as they become, you know, the, the, the predominant homeowners, they're going to want to do more about it. And I think, yes, they will be, they'll be inclined to put solar on their own house, but also, you know, saying to the developer of their new house, for example, uh, you know, if I'm going to buy this house, I want you to put some some solar panels on it. Um, so I, we're starting to see that happening more and more. So so I, I think it's, they're going to become more ubiquitous. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're quite visible um, but they're, they're something that, that, that people generally like. If you, we, they did a survey fairly recently, and, and you know, about 80% of people said they love solar, or they liked it anyway. <laughs> well, social positivity is like a huge trend at the moment. Obviously, you've got COP26, everything, the Green Initiative for our NHG. Um, we're really trying, and I do agree with you there. I think that uh, it is going to be the next, or it's the becoming step. Um, for everyone and all generations and I think people of all ages are starting to realize that it is impacting the environment and this is the way forward now Mm. yes yes absolutely I agree great so I guess that's all we have time for today Um, thank you so much for coming on this has been the green initiative Um, I just want to say thanks again for coming on our show and Don't forget to like, subscribe and leave a comment.